For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about a weary world rejoicing. Uh, you know, and the weariness of what it was for Israel, the weariness for what it is for us as we come to this always special season of the year. We're usually so tired, we can't really, uh, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, celebrate and enjoy and experience the joy that this season brings. And I know if you're like me, you're weary of weary, <laughs> right? You know, we, okay, let's talk about the good stuff. Now, how about the good stuff, Bruce? Oh, that's why we're shifting gears this week, because we want to consider the whole idea and concept of joy, because really, joy is the cure for weariness. A weary world, weary, yes, but still, a weary world rejoices. I want you to take just a moment and stop and consider the songs that we sing during this special season. You know, songs about joy. Joy is written into the very fabric of Christmas. Uh, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Uh, oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, good Christian men, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Uh, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, we've done that one. The mountains in reply echo back their joyous strain. See, it's a season of joy and sometimes we miss the joy part. So what is it that generates all of this joy at this particular time of year? It's not the angels. It's not the shepherds. They're basically bit players in this great drama as it unfolds. It's not Herod. It's not the wise men. It's not even Joseph and Mary that generates this joy. The cause for joy is the message that the angels delivered to the shepherds on that first Christmas night. The Bible says in Luke 2, then an angel of the Lord stood before them, the shepherds, and because they're out in a field, you know, tending their sheep. The glory of the Lord was shining around them, and they became very frightened. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I'm bringing you good news that will be a great joy to all the people. Today your Savior was born in the town of David. He is Christ the Lord. There it is. That, there's where the joy comes. The joy comes from the message that was delivered by the angels to the shepherds. Uh, The greatest news the world has ever heard of all time, for all time. It is the greatest news. It is the high point of redemptive history. It's the greatest moment in the history of the world when the angels announced the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's good news. It's not just good news, it is great news. It's good news that we have a God who wants to save us. It's great news that we have a Savior, that he sent a Savior for you and me. It's good news there's one who is coming who has taken away the sins of all the earth. It's good news because the good news is when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and leader of our life, our sins are forgiven and our future is secured eternally in heaven. That's good news, amen? And it's such good news that it ought to be produced great joy, right? It's good news of great joy, which is the absolute opposite of fear. And you can check it any time throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament. Any time God gave an instruction, you know, he would say, do not be afraid. To the prophets, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He gets to Mary and Joseph, do not be afraid. To the shepherds, do not be afraid. Here's the amazing thing. That if you go back and check it throughout all of Scripture, anytime God delivered a message and started with do not be afraid, it was always followed by a message of grace and mercy. Don't be afraid, I bring you good news. Don't be afraid, Mary, you know, because you're going to have a baby. Don't be afraid, Joseph, because everything's cool, you know. Every time God told somebody not to be afraid, it was always followed. The message wasn't one of, of, uh, of revenge. It wasn't one of punishment. It was always... Always a message of grace and mercy. Don't be afraid. And this news is so good that the angel said it's going to bring great joy. That's a cure for weariness. Great joy. And Christmas is great joy. Not just joy, but great joy. And the word there literally means laughter. (laughs) Hilarity, you know. (laughs) You know, this is, you know. The same words when he uh, talks about he wants to be a joyous giver, it's the word hilarity. I, you know, here comes the offering, boy. This is a great time, best time of the service. See, I, we don't hear that much, but, you know, I'm just saying, you know. It's the same word. You know, this is going to make you laugh. I, I, I've heard people say, you know, uh, I'm so weary, I'm so tired, I just want to cry. You heard that? 
Rarely, never have I heard anybody say, I'm so weary, I just want to laugh. <laughs> I, you know, I've never heard that, but that's the whole idea here. That the news is so great, it should make you laugh. It should bring forth joy. See, that's joy expressing itself when we laugh. And that's what he said. This is great news of great joy. The kind of joy Peter talks about when he talks about an inexpressible and glorious joy in 1 Peter 1.8. And isn't that one of the drawbacks, really? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves this Christmas season, that we become so engaged and consumed and even overwhelmed by everything Christmas that, you know, by the time we get to Christmas Day, there's not a whole lot of joy left. There's no reserve for joy, you know. That, that ought to be the day when you say, I'm so weary I can laugh. Because <laughs> that's what it's all about. It's great news of great joy, uh, we get too weary that we, to celebrate exactly what has happened and what we celebrate on that day. Uh, and our joy by the time we get to Christmas, after all this other stuff going on, we look like one of those, uh, one of those inflatables, you know. Uh, 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 my neighbor has a bunch of them. I mean a bunch of them uh, in their yard. They're all over the place, you know. You could have a convention. It looks like a convention of inflatables, you know. But let me tell you, by the time, we're so weary sometimes by, we, when they turn them off, you know. <laughs> huh? Santa Claus, deer, everything just laying on the ground I'm like, boy, I've had it, you know. That's kind of the way we feel by the time we get to Christmas Day, isn't it? You know, there's nothing left. There's no joy left. It's like, there we are, you know. I, you wanna, yeah, I want to go put a get well balloon on them. You know? <laughs> Tonight when the sun goes down, you're going to rise up. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the way it's supposed to be the whole message is a message of joy I, I don't know how can you not celebrate Christmas with joy I, I, I'll tell you how we cannot because like I say we become so you know sometimes we just get angry uh, I, I, I've I'm off script here because it just came to my head. And that's, you know, that's the way I am is that, you know, we get angry, you know, because we, don't they know what the reason for the season is? You know, Xmas, you know, they took Christ out of Christmas, you know, all, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, that, uh, that you know, just it seems to infuriate us about Christmas, right? And that's not the point at all, you know. Hey, the fact that they're even talking about Christmas ought to bring great news, Right? You know, however it is. I, I said this last week. If they want to start celebrating Christmas in July, that's okay by me. You know, go ahead and start. You know, anytime we can take the national conversation to, and point it towards Jesus is not a bad thing. Okay? Oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to move on. The highest and greatest joy, you know, uh, is that a Savior, a Savior is born to you. Now think about that for just a second. A Savior, our Savior. Your Savior, my Savior, has been born. That's the highest and best joy for those who receive the salvation that this baby in a manger brings to you and to me. This is the joy that comes to those who receive that grace, that message of grace of salvation. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. And this good news is the best news ever. Uh, it, it's what uh, we want to tell the world, right? I've got good news for you. When Jesus said, go into all the world and tell the good news, that's the same word. Good news, that's what we're supposed to do. We've been instructed to share the good news. And what better time than to do that <laughs> than in the season of good news? Most people are receptive, more receptive now in this season than any other time. It's good news, the best news in the world, because this good news is for all people. Nobody's excluded. It's for all people. So the good news that the angels talked about extends to every nation, all the people. See, that's the big picture of the, this good news is that it's for all the people. In this moment, it's a pretty small circle, the shepherds. And everybody's saying, well, you know, anybody in that day would have said, yeah, okay, not so much. I don't know why you would have gone to shepherds because you're a king, you know. You, you're, kind of a, you're, you're not just kind of a big deal. You are a big deal. And the angel says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. That's right. You guys standing there sheep, taking care of your sheep at night, to you a Savior has been born. You who have taken up occupancy on the lowest rung of the socioeconomic uh, times of the day. You know, the least of anybody. 
the shepherds. An honorable job, but it was, you know, you were at the bottom of the barrel. And God chose to announce that birth of the greatest news ever to a bunch of shepherds, which tells us the Savior has been born. And the Savior that has been born will be the Savior of everybody. Everybody. Anybody who comes and believes in Jesus. That's to the humblest, the most ignorant, the most uneducated, the most lowly, the most unskilled, even despised, even the chief of sinners, even the lowest of the low. Jesus has come to save them. He is the Savior of everybody who will be saved. For every people, every tribe, every tongue, every nation on the face of the earth. And if anybody chooses to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and leader of their life, he is your Savior. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Let's look at that word Savior for just a second. What does that really mean? Well, I looked it up. And it says this, a Savior is a person who saves. (laughs) Wow, you know, that's deep stuff there, right? A person who saves, rescues, or delivers. Now, just in the word itself, when you read it by definition, it implies that there's some kind of threatening condition when you need a Savior. That there's some kind of dangerous or desperate condition or even some kind of deadly condition from which we need to be rescued or saved. See, that's Savior. That's what it means. Jesus came to save the world. That was foretold in the prophecies of old, and it came to be when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. See, he didn't come to be an example of nobility or or, or morality or integrity. He didn't come as an example of passivity. He didn't come to demonstrate patience and kindness and mercy and tenderness. You see, we kind of get lost in all that. He did all that. Don't get me wrong. He did all of that, but he came. His primary purpose was to save the world the universal problem for which which God sent Jesus to you and to me to save us from the problem of guilt and sin that's all everything that's bound up in the message that the angel gave to the shepherds that night that the one who is born today in the city of David who's lying back there in Bethlehem in a feed trough in a stable the one there is the one who has come to save you That's what the angel told Joseph. You'll call him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. That's the whole idea. He came as our Savior. And he said, that's why you've got to name him Jesus because his name means salvation. So this is good news. That's the joy of Christmas, the good news that the angels brought. The good news of great joy is for all the people. That's what it says. And the good news that there is born for you today in the city of David, which born to you... Again, that individualizes this whole idea that the Savior has come. You know, hey, shepherds, it's born to you. And that's universal good news. A Savior has been born. But that's not all. The baby's not just a Savior, but he is Christ the Lord. Now this, you know, to me this is fascinating. It may not be so much to you, but it's fascinating to me, you know, because it kind of covers all the bases here. He is Christ the Lord. That term Christ means the anointed one. The anointed one, or Messiah, okay, Christ, Messiah. See, back in Israel's history, when God had a leader of the people, when he called a prophet, when he called a priest, when he, called, you know, when he had kings, when he had uh, judges, all of, those, all of those folks were anointed at one time or another by someone in authority. Prophets were God's spokesmen, so they were anointed to carry God's message to Israel, uh, everyone. They anointed prophets, they anointed high priests, they anointed kings. Samuel anointed David and Saul as king of Israel. See? They anointed him. They anointed prophets. Well, look at this, Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. It's in the past. Uh, Many times and in many different ways. Look at this. But now in these last days, God has spoken to us through who? His son. His son. And his son, Jesus, this little child in a feed trough, is the greatest prophet, the greatest preacher that ever lived. The one who spoke that when what came out of his mouth was always truth. He is prophet. The best and the greatest that ever lived. They also anointed high priests. Um, 
and the high priest was the person, the only person, you know, that was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and temples. And it was the high priest who was actually the go-between, the mediary, the uh, uh, intercessor between God and his people. And he was the only one that could speak on behalf of his people to God. And God would speak through the high priest. Look at this in the past. Uh, therefore, uh, Hebrews 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, who is that? Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So not only is he the greatest prophet ever lived, he is the high priest. The one mediator between us and God is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this baby in the manger is the anointed high priest, the final, the final and glorious high priest. The one by whom death has literally severed the veil. We sang about that earlier. You know, and, and cleared the way to access between you and God and the presence of God. The veil that separated humanity from God. The law, all of that stuff. And Jesus Christ became our intercessor. He became our high priest. The one and only who gives us access to our heavenly father. The great high priest who takes us into the very presence of God. They also anointed kings. As I said, Samuel anointed Saul and and then David, and that kind of all kind of caused all kinds of grief for David after he, Saul learned that for sure. But they did that, you know. He said, "Here's who I want you." And Samuel would go. Other prophets would uh, anoint. Uh, Saul was the first, of course, but uh, they would anoint their kings as long as they had a king. That's what they did. They anointed kings. The angel told Mary this. Says he will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give unto him the throne of King David, his ancestor. By the way, he met that ancestral line on both sides of his family. Okay, so he was the only rightful heir to the throne of David. He will rule over the people of Jacob, Israel, forever. And his kingdom will never end. Not only is he prophet, not only is he priest, but he is king. He is in the line of David, and he will reign forever and ever as the ultimate eternal king. That's what the Bible says, Revelation 19. On his robe and on his upper leg was written this name. Let's read that together. King of kings and Lord of lords. This little child in a feed trough is the greatest king the world will ever know. The greatest priest the world will ever know. The greatest prophet the world would ever know. All summed up in one person. Jesus. Messiah. King of kings. And Lord of lords. That's confirmed in Revelation chapter 5. The Bible says, talking about the angels, because this is what angels do. you know, And they sang a new song. Saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's read that together. Go back for me there, Kim. Uh, Yeah, there. We're going to read this together, okay? I, I, you know, I know this is different. I just feel like we need to stand when we read this particular. So would you stand with me as we read this together? That way you can just really shout it out. All right, here we go. One, two, three. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Now, big and loud now. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The greatest king, the greatest priest, the greatest prophet who ever lived was that baby lying in a manger. Amen. You may be seated. A weary world rejoices. I don't know how you cannot be joyful at this particular time of year. There's more joy producing, one more joy producing title that is used in this text. Not only is he savior, not only is he the anointed prophet, priest, and king, but he is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now, 
we, we kind of get confused in this modern era because just in the recent death of Queen Elizabeth, you know, uh, if you followed any of that, they were talking about lords and ladies, <laughs> you know, uh, and they got special titles because of the family they may have been born into or because of the particular property, they territory they may have controlled. And there's Lord this, and Lady this. And, you know, you, you know, if you're a big fan of PBS, <laughs> and who is that writer? Uh, Jane, Jane Austen. Is that right? Did I get that right, Connie? Okay. Because, you know, yeah, okay. Lords and ladies, you know, Lord this and Lord that, you know. And you're going, wow, holy cow, how do you keep up with all that? Well, that's a, a title of of honor, you know, a, a, a title of, of esteem, revered, highly esteemed, you know, when you are a Lord or a lady. But I'm going to tell you this title of Jesus is Lord is way beyond all of that because all of that, a title of human de designation, what we see, this is one of divine designation. And if it's all about the territory, <laughs> one controls, I want you to think about it. He is Lord of all because he controls it all. Get it? Huh? Yeah. I mean, that's the deal. He is Lord of all. And so for the angels to say that this baby in the manger is Jesus, the, the Christ, the Son of God, and Lord, it's saying that this child is God in the flesh. See, even that title goes all the way back before time. It goes all the way back to a time of creation when he was there. And in the Christmas story, according to John, this is what the way John puts it, and it's classic in the beginning. Now, it's funny because he goes back before time. Before creation, it says in the beginning. And look what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And look at this. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. There it is. Through him, all things were made. So there's the territory. <laughs> he made it all. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That title is the most fundamental and basic confession of the Christian faith. Jesus is Lord. Say that with me. Jesus is Lord. One more time. Jesus is Lord. See, without that, without that, you don't have Christianity. If he's not Lord, you don't have Christianity. That's why Paul wrote this in Romans 10, verse 9. He said, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, that's non-negotiable. You, you, can't, you, you can't have Jesus Messiah without Jesus Lord. The baby in the barn, whose birth we celebrate in this season, is God in the flesh. Scholars call that God incarnate, in the flesh. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. And that implies sovereignty and authority over all things. Why? Because he created all things. The earth is his and the fullness thereof. Later, Jesus would de declare that. Before his ascension, he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So the good news is this. The good news is salvation has come. The good news is that salvation reaches to everybody, anybody, and everyone. The good news is the person and the source of that salvation, who is Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, king, and Lord, and none other than God himself. Now, just think about it. Those are amazing titles given to a one-day-old baby <laughs> in a barn. huh? Think about that. The wealth, the grandeur, all of the majesty of those, little, oh, those titles, that stands in stark contrast to a stinky stall, doesn't it? Oh, holy night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt his worth. A thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night divine. Let me add one more element of joy because this is what comes up next. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just kind of go through this. Sometimes the familiar becomes too familiar, right? The announcement made to the shepherds. They made that, and then look at this. 
and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. The whole idea of how you please God, by committing your life to him. You know, there's where peace comes. But here's the thing. You know, if one angel scared the bejeebers out of them, you know, and the angel had to say, do not be afraid. What do you think? You know, here, we get all caught up in this, you know, because in the nativity we, we've got, you know, because you only have so many, you only have so many angel robes, right? <laughs> so you only have two or three angels, you know, say glory to God the highest, you know. The word that's used here, a multitude, is the same word that's used over in Revelation when it talks about thousands and hundreds of thousands of angels that, that, that are in heaven shouting and singing and praising and glorifying God because that's what angels do. It's the same word. So we're not talking three or four uh, angels in robes. We, we could be talking about thousands upon thousands. Personally, I believe that the whole sky was filled with angels singing glory to God in the highest and on earth. The old King James, because everybody knows they spoke in King James. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Hundreds of thousands of angels, you see. Because our little minds can't get our minds around that idea that there were hundreds of thousands. It wasn't just one. It was a multitude. And every time that word is used in the New Testament, it talks about thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And what are they doing? They're doing what angels do. They're glorifying and praising God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. They were praising God because Jesus was born. They were praising God because the Savior had come. They were praising God for the Savior who is Christ the Lord. They were praising God that once and for all, through one person, peace, peace would come to those, anyone and everyone who would believe in and follow Jesus. See, that's the ultimate expression of joy. To praise and glorify God. Praising and glorifying God is the highest pinnacle of thought and action. The reason for everything. The whole earth shouts his praise. Glorifying God. The heavens, we're told, declare the glory of God. The mountains declare the glory of God. The greatest expression of joy is to glorify God. Another great old carol of Christmas. Come thou long expected Jesus. Born to set thy people free. From our fears and sin release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation. Hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation. Joy of every longing heart. Born thy people to deliver Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own and eternal spirit. Rule in our hearts alone. By thine all sufficient merit. Raise us to thy glorious throne. Let's pray. Father, forgive us when we allow everything else to get in the way, get in our heart's way, our mind's way of celebrating the greatest moment in all of history for all time. We celebrate this season. And sometimes we can get so caught up in the season we forget the reason. And I'm not, I'm not being cliche about that, Lord. I'm just, I just know we get so busy. And Father, this is great news of great joy for everyone, for everyone here, that you can bring peace to our troubled hearts. And God, I know sometimes the weariness, not just of the season, but the weariness of of what we go through as humans, some greater degrees than others. But Lord, sometimes life can make us weary, life and illness. And the loss of a loved one. We're weary from the hurts and pain of this world. Father, let us turn our eyes and our hearts toward you to glorify you, to praise your name for sending our deliverer. We are in a desperate situation. 
we're weary. Help us to turn our eyes to you for the greatest expression of joy there is. And that is to glorify you. Glory to God in the highest. Let that be our song in the days ahead. Beyond Christmas even. In Jesus name. Amen. Maybe you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ. You never made that decision to call him Lord of your life. It's a big deal. Believe me. And there are people in this room who have experienced that, who have been obedient to that. And the only source you're going to have for peace, and really the only source for joy, is the right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you've never made that choice, if you've never confessed Him as Lord in your life, we want to extend to you that invitation. An invitation that comes from a little baby. An invitation that says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And I'll give you rest. He stands today to receive you. To offer you peace. And eternal life. If you've not made that decision. I'm going to give you a chance here. We're going to sing this great carol of Christmas. That talks about who this baby is. And if you're ready to make that choice. And that decision. To make him the Lord of your life. I'm going to invite you to step out. Let's stand and let's sing together. celebrate that truth the babe the son of Mary the one who brought us joy the message of joy the peace that we have because of our relationship with Jesus Christ the Lord sometimes we need to be reminded of that and it's we're fortunate here because we're a church that is reminded of the sacrifice Jesus made for us on our behalf that brought salvation and peace and joy to our lives we do that every week here to be reminded because he knows how forgetful we can be. And sometimes even in the most busiest of seasons, we need to be reminded that Jesus came, that he came to save, and that he came to save to the uttermost. And so we have joy and we have peace 
and we have hope because of what he has done for us. And so, not that we necessarily need to be, but I think maybe probably all of us from, well, every seven days <laughs> need to be reminded of the great truth of how much he loves you and me and what he was willing to do for you and for me. So as we remember his sacrifice, we celebrate his coming and his birth, God in the flesh. The wafer represents in Jesus what Jesus taught, the body of Christ. And so in this special season, we can remember that Jesus came just like we all come into this world as a baby. Let's partake of the wafer together, remembering the body of Christ. And while he was God, he was God in the flesh. And we celebrate the fact that he gave his blood to cover our sins when we remember that when we drink the cup. Let's drink the cup together. Father God, we are beyond joy today. It's always good to be reminded, but even more so to take a moment and consider the great joy that came when you came to earth. The profound truth that not only is it God in the flesh, but it's joy and peace, hope in flesh. And as weary as we might be through this season, that we just breathe a sigh of relief on December 26th and say, okay. Father, remind us always that you came to save. You accomplished your ministry and your mission on the cross. You said, it is finished and for us, it was just beginning. The hope we have, eternal life, joy, the resurrection, all of those things that contribute to our joy today and our remembrance of those truths. In Jesus' name.